it belongs in a museum. Or maybe that idea belongs in a museum and the artifacts themselves belong with people of the originating culture. I don't know, just throwing that out there. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny takes Harrison Ford's iconic archaeologist on one last big cinematic adventure, making new friends, reuniting with old enemies, and working to tie up some loose ends. Directed by James Mangold, the fifth and final movie in the indie franchise takes us around the world in pursuit of time travel and makes a pretty meta statement about fixing the past along the way. We'll break all of that down, plus we finally have an answer to what happened to Shia LaBeouf's Mutt Williams and whether or not this movie finally proves a fitting end to the indie saga, so grab your hat and your whip and get ready for this adventure. After you, Junior. Yes, sir. Ah! But first, and you probably don't need an ancient treasure map to figure this out, we're gonna break this whole thing down, and along the way, that means spoilers. Big ones, all the important stuff. So if you haven't seen Dial of Destiny yet, and or just don't wanna know what happens, now would be the perfect time to hide inside a 1950s refrigerator while we spoil the whole film. explained in the movie, the titular Dial of Destiny is more math than magic. But like all Indiana Jones MacGuffins, it's pretty much, effectively, for all intents and purposes, magic. Created by the most famous mathematician and inventor of ancient Greece, Archimedes, the dial is called the Antikythera, effectively the most ancient form of analog computing. These things are based in reality and could be used to predict astronomical positions well in advance. This one is a little bit different and a lot more fantastical because it's able to predict fissures in time physical, literal openings that lead to another point in history, which exist for a very short period and are findable on Earth before they close. You know, time portals. So basically, one could walk, drive, or fly through one of these portals and travel back to the past to alter history, which is something a bitter loser of a Nazi might want to use to his advantage 30 years after the fact. That's right, Nazis are trying to find and use mystical artifacts to win World War II. The formula for the best Indiana Jones movie is back yet again. But since this movie is set in 1969, these are all actually former Nazis, including Mads Mikkelsen's Jürgen Voller, who the US government recruited to help NASA beat the Soviets to landing on the moon. If you've always found that part of US history unsettling, you're in good company because Indy also doesn't like it. And yeah, he's right as usual about not giving Nazis even an inch. Nazis, I hate these guys. So in the movie, The Dial of Destiny was legendarily split into two parts. One, missing and needing retrieval via daring puzzle solving in 1969. The other, found and in the possession of Basil Shaw, a friend and ally of Indies during World War II, after they retrieved it during a mission against Hitler's forces, including Voller. Over the years, Basil became obsessed with the dial to the point where it was hurting his and his family's well-being, so Indy took it away from him with the promise that he would destroy it. He obviously never did that, and when the movie finds an elderly washed up, mostly alcoholic Indy in 1969, he's joined by Basil's thrill-seeking adventurer daughter Helena to complete the dial and keep it away from Voller, who seeks to use it to correct Hitler's mistakes and win the war. Together, Indy and Helena retrieve an ancient engraving, pointing to the location of the other half of the dial, find its secret meaning, and complete a displacement puzzle in Archimedes' tomb, leading them to the dial and proof of time travel, a modern watch. Unfortunately, Voller and his goons catch up to them, knock Indy out, and throw him aboard their plane, which is headed straight into a time fissure that Voller set for August 20th, 1939, so that he can enact his evil plan and basically take Hitler's place and, you know, conquer the world or whatever. Indy loudly yells at them that they're wrong and not headed where they think they are, that they didn't account for continental drift, which neither Archimedes nor anyone from his time would have known about, instilling doubt in Voller as they breach the fissure. Helena emerges as a stowaway to save Indy while her sidekick, a boy named Teddy, pilots another plane just behind them and they they all go through the time fisher back in time to... To Sicily, year 214 AD. Nice work, you dumb Nazi. But to be specific, they wind up at the Roman siege of Syracuse, a moment in history described earlier in one of Professor Jones' college lectures. Voller and his henchmen die in a plane crash, and Archimedes himself takes the dial off of Voller's corpse, along with his watch, which is a little weird, as Indy and Helena bear witness. Turns out both Indy and Voller were wrong. Archimedes rigged the dial to only return to him at this specific point in time so that he would have the completed dial. Archimedes essentially made a call through time for help and it was answered. It's a time paradox that only Bill and or Ted themselves could have possibly imagined. 
All right, great job, everybody. Let's go home. Except, wait, Indy doesn't want to go home. He wants to stay in the past with Archimedes, living history like he'd always dreamed. Helena pleads with him to get on the working plane with her and Teddy so they can actually, you know, go back to their own time period, and that his presence would actually mess up history and that they need him, and he replies that there's nothing for him in 1969, and Helena says that they have to go now, the fissure's gonna close, and Indy still says no, and then Helena makes an executive call and just punches him in the face and drags him home. And hey, in her defense, she tried to reason he was just being a crotchety old man. Okay, quick break. When we come back, what happened to Indy's son, Mutt? There is an answer to this, and we'll get into it. Stick around. Indy's long-lost son, Mutt, as you may recall, is characterized as a bit of a hothead. Said hot-headedness and bickering with his old man led him to enlist in the military during a war to spite him, and he was killed in action. Given the timing, it's likely he died in or around the Vietnam War, or perhaps the Korean War. Now, I know what you're thinking. Yay, Mutt's dead, but hold on, because his death actually broke Marianne's heart and led to the fracture of her marriage with Indy, resulting in divorce papers and his sad and broken state for most of this film. But let's drop back into the final scenes of the movie. Indy wakes up at home in his apartment surrounded by pain medication. He's back in 1969 and not incredibly psyched about it. Helena is also there, along with Sala and his family, who Indy helped move to America at some point, by the way. Indy's upset with Helena, but she argues that he does have something to live for as she invites in a guest, Marion Ravenwood. Helena takes everybody out for ice cream, leaving Indy and Marion alone, and they seem to reconcile, mirroring their whole where doesn't it hurt elbow kiss scene from Raiders. Wow. Well, God damn it, Indy, where doesn't it hurt? Here. Here. And finally, the camera pulls away to show Indy's hat drawing on a clothesline outside of the apartment. The screen reduces to circle around the hat, just like the old-timey film editing technique, and just before it closes completely, we see Indy grab his hat and pull it off camera. And that's it. That's the end. No one else takes the mantle. There's no post credit scene teasing the next Indiana Jones. This is presumably the end to Indiana Jones' cinematic journey, as Harrison Ford has repeatedly said that he's done with the character once and for all. After Mutt walked away with Indy's hat back in Crystal Skull, and rumors that Helena would assume the main role in this last entry, none of that actually happened in Dial of Destiny. Indy reconciles the past, present, and becomes satisfied with the reality of his future in this ending to his story, which is almost poetic to us, the longtime audience. Would the ending of The Last Crusade have been the most ideal? Yes, probably, but that's not what happened. Crystal Skull happened and made its own statement, and instead of pretending it never occurred, because it did, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny reconciles it, reconciles Indy's mistakes and misfortunes, and makes a statement about moving forward despite that rather than dwelling forever in the idealized past. I think that's a very fitting choice and one of the best possible resolutions to all of it, the full picture Mangold in the film could have possibly made. But what did you think of Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny? Is there a chance that Indy could somehow return once again? And how would you have ended this whole series? Let us know in the comments below. As always, thank you for watching this episode of Cannon Fodder. I'm Max Scovel, and for more Indy, check out our full review, and don't forget to follow and subscribe to IGN wherever you like to watch. We'll see you next time.